Our next speaker is Dr. Jeff Aguirre. Uh, he is in the Department of Neurology, is an expert in, the, in functional neuroimaging. Uh, Martha mentioned uh, promise, peril, and hype. And in part, I think that's what Dr. Uh, Guiri will talk about, uh, which is uh, the way in which functional neuroimaging has been used, uh, both in the scientific literature and in the lay press, and will uh, guide us uh, to a better understanding of this technique. Great. Thanks, Anjan. Well, so images like these are a great example of the pervasive influence of cognitive neuroscience that Martha was describing before. So pictures of the brain now appear in all sorts of publications that you see, both within the scientific literature as well as within the lay press, and are starting to have an influence, as we've heard and will hear, in all sorts of areas outside of uh, simple neuroscience. And so the technology for producing these pictures is now ubiquitous. Uh, the methods are very well established. But there remains, however, a problem of interpretation. So this particular image is taken from the op-ed pages of the New York Times, and it was generated when scientists from UCLA uh, joined forces with some business partners and recorded neural activity from voters uh, in the lead up to the primaries of the 2008 election. So they, they obtained these brain pictures while, while voters looked at pictures of the different candidates. And then uh, interpreting the results of a picture like this came to conclusions like voters felt a sense of conflict when they uh, saw pictures of Hillary Clinton and thus had uh, uh, unresolved feelings regarding her candidacy. Well, you know, the scientific community reacted fairly harshly to this sort of interpretation and this presentation of the work. And this op-ed has been repeatedly held up as an example of the unsupported conclusions that can follow from a very well-made neuroimage. And indeed, in recent months, there's been a bit of a movement towards increased criticism of neuroimaging as a field. Uh, so maybe there should be a better way for us to think in general about uh, how to evaluate the claims of neuroimaging studies and separate uh, substantiated from fairly unsubstantiated claims. Well, so I'm going to try and offer a basic guide. So it turns out that neuroimaging studies can tend to fall into one of three categories. And for each category, we can identify sort of a central question that lets us uh, figure out whether or not the claims are well established or maybe extend a little bit beyond what can be claimed. So the first type of study uses something called forward inference. So in this experiment, the scientist tries to control the behavior of the subject and isolate a particular mental state to then try and learn which region of the brain is activated in response to that. So uh, the newsworthiness of these studies often derives from the perhaps surprising claim that a fairly complicated behavior or emotion is associated with some discrete area of the, of the brain. So for example, the claim that there would be a more uh, morality area of the brain, or that we found the piece of brain that's for love. So the potential error here is to declare that a single spot in the brain is for something. Uh, the key question to ask is, how did we actually isolate this, this fairly complicated emotion? How do we try and find that pure essence of love so that we can isolate it and study it in the lab? Well, so one prevalent approach is to try and subtract two different behavioral states. Uh, leaving behind the pure, isolated mental or emotional state that's under study. So for example, trying to compare the brain activity that is observed when a subject views pictures of their spouse versus pictures of a good friend. The idea being that the difference between those two conditions would leave behind uh, the state of romantic love. Well, we can imagine that there's a lot of ways that that particular subtraction might, that it might fail, that there might be several different behavioral or emotional states that might differ between seeing pictures of your spouse or seeing pictures of a good friend. So this is a fairly crude example, and there certainly are refinements of the technique in much better uh, uh, constructed studies. Um, but it illustrates the core assumption that lies behind these sorts of forward inf inference studies. One must isolate a particular behavioral state to study it to then identify a piece of brain that's associated with it. However, most of the neuroimaging studies that have particular social impact these days are of the second kind and uh, could be called a reverse inference study. So in this kind of study, the presence of local brain activity is used now to infer the presence of a particular behavioral or emotional state on the part of the subject. So for example, the uh, brain image that we started out our discussion with uh, is an example of a type of reverse inference study, where we try to uh, learn the emotional state of voters when they view pictures of Hillary Clinton and uh, conclude, for example, that because there's activation within the anterior cingulate, that subjects experience a state of conflict. Well, so a similar kind of logic is the basis of many headline-grabbing studies, such as the finding that people with severe uh, grief have a paradoxical feeling of pleasure when they view pictures of departed loved ones, or that uh, hearing a lie evokes the same sorts of sensations as seeing uh, disgusting food. Uh, 
Well, the central assumption that's behind these kinds of studies is that there is a one-to-one -one link between activity in a particular area of the brain and a particular emotional or behavioral state. And the extent to which then that the conclusion is justified for the study depends upon the strength of that link. So coming back to the Hillary Clinton example, if it's the case uh, that the anterior cingulate could be activated by other sorts of behavioral or emotional states, say memory or emotion or optimism, decision making, all different uh, uh, mental states that have been identified as activating the anterior cingulate, then who's to say that the, the particular emotional or behavioral state that subjects feel when they see that picture of Hillary is actually one of conflict. It could be any one of these other states that have been identified. So that really is the, the core assumption that in reverse inference. How well established is that link? And if we dig beneath the surface, we might find that in some studies it's well established, and in other studies, no. The final and third type of study is a cutting edge twist on that reverse inference approach. And instead of looking at just a single area to try and deduce the mental or behavioral state of a subject, a computer is trained to look at multiple areas, multiple regions across the brain, and identify the pattern of brain activity that's associated with a particular state. So, this is the basis of a, a number of studies that uh, fall almost into the category of mind reading. For example, having a, a computer that can look at the brain activity and determine which of many thousands of pictures a subject is looking at at the time, or, or which word they're thinking of, or, or even if you're telling the truth. So the key question to ask here is, how generalizable is the result? So the method works by training a computer with a particular set of examples of stimuli and then uh, trying to see then if the computer can later on guess which, of an, which example stimulus is being presented at the time. The real question is, can the computer, can the, the, tr the result of the study generalize beyond the stimuli that were used? So this is particularly important when we think about the example of lie detection. So we might be able to train a computer in a particular experimental paradigm to be able to tell which of a particular playing card you're holding and if you're telling the truth about whether or not you hold the ace of spades but we're still quite a far way off from trying to determine what actually happened in Vegas that night. So to summarize, uh, although there's a huge variety of different neuroimaging studies that are out there, they can all boil down to really three core types, and those being a forward inference study where we try and control behavior and learn something about where in the brain there's an activation, a reverse inference study where we try and take a look at the location of activity in the brain and learn something about the mental or emotional state of the subject, and then finally, that twist on reverse inference, trying to look at the pattern across the entire brain to learn something about a mental state. And for each of those cases, there's a core question that you can ask to try and determine if the claims that are being made extend a little bit beyond what can actually be supported by the data. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jeff.